I am not going to dance around this. I'm just going to say straight up, we have an agenda at IFYC. Okay? That's right. Ready for this? Here is our agenda. We want to find the people who we think are doing the most exciting, influential, innovative, interfaith leadership work around religious diversity in the country. And we want students who are growing in their interfaith leadership to see what they're doing and to say, I can be that person. Right? So what we have done is uh, um, called our Rolodex and said, who do we know that if you're interested in public policy and law and are committed to the American principle of religious freedom, uh, who do we know that uh, would be the, the shining star in that space that we could put in front of you on, on that topic? And that's Monte Alvarado. Who do we know that is building what we think of as a 21st century Hull House inspired by uh, a religious commitment that is both building a big tent ethos within the religious community that it works within, but is serving the city and the nation in the range of its work. And that would be Ali Abalal. Who do we know that uh, um, is honestly, you know, I'm not supposed to say this, but like the best religion writer in the country. Uh, and that would be Emma Green uh, at the Atlantic. So um, I'm just super excited to have the three of them with us tonight. And my job is to just have them tell their stories so that if you're 19 or 20 at the University of Laverne or at Elon or at Pepperdine or at the University of Hartford or at Harvard or at Illinois State or Grand Valley or whatever, you're like, you know what? I've been reading Emma Green for like five years and there she is. And I think that I could try to walk that path. Or I've admired Iman since I was like 11, right? And there's Alia Bilal, and I want to do that one day, right? Or religious freedom is, is not uh, a dimension that we talk about enough on my campus, but I've heard about the work of the Beckett Fund, and there's the person who runs it, Monse Alvarado. So that's the agenda tonight. Uh, and let's just start with like a super straightforward question. Tell us about your work, about two minutes. Like, like what's the purpose? What's, uh, what are the key activities? And what is it that brought you to that work? Right, so why don't we start with Alia and just go this way and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll change up the order here and again, but we'll just go this way for right now. All right, in the name of God, the most gracious, most merciful. Peace be upon you all. Um, I will give you a the friendly and happy disclaimer uh, up front that as some of you may have seen when I walked out, I am about eight and a half months uh, full of child in here. And so, oh, thank you. That's just a disclaimer to say that there will probably be a lot of heavy breathing. Don't mind me. Um, so, uh, so again, I work for Iman and, um, the work of Iman is essentially, and has been for the last 21 years, trying to foster health, wellness, and healing in the inner city. Uh, we are based here in Chicago and have been since, uh, the mid nineties, uh, with a branch now in Atlanta, uh, that has been flourishing for the last four years. And essentially, um, we are engaged in the work of trying to, um, to really model this holistic approach towards uh, both building community, um, meeting people's needs while really transforming neighborhoods and, and, uh, and cities and, and hopefully eventually countries. Um, you know, the, 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 our work is, is, is separated into four main areas um, that surround this very holistic approach. Um, and it's, it's really the core of it is the idea that, um, that we, cannot, um, we cannot really approach the issues that we approach um, from a siloed um, you know, perspective. That if you're trying to you know, combat poverty, you're trying to combat homelessness, you're trying to combat 
uh, you know, um, uh, a failing education system, that, um, that none of those issues exist uh, on their own. None of those issues exist in silos. And so our work um, is, is separated into four uh, distinct but very integrated um, uh, departments. We do health, um, holistic health. We have a, a federally designated health center that pr uh, provides primary behavioral and dental health care. Um, we do organizing and advocacy around criminal justice reform, around parole, uh, parole reform, around food justice, around increasing access to fresh, healthy foods in our neighborhoods. Um, we cultivate leadership. Um, we you know, have our own community, uh, community organizing curriculum that we shop around the country and that we're really training leaders around the country on. Uh, we believe very heavily in the arts and in the power of the arts to inspire and to motivate change. And so we do a lot of arts work from presenting artwork to, um, you know, local ciphers in corner stores um, or, you know, uh, uh, local classes in our, in our ceramic studio. And then uh, this program that really has been focusing for the last 10 years uh, on uh, the needs uh, and on the potential of the demographic um, that I think is oftentimes uh, shunned, is oftentimes um, neglected, and that is um, the really growing demographic of particularly black and brown men and women that are coming home from prison with X's on their backs, as well as those 18 to 25 year olds that are really just caught up, and caught up in the cycle of violence and trying to get themselves out. And so we have a program called Green Reentry, which is intended to teach the trades, uh, construction trades to these individuals to, um, to really, um, you know, to, to not only to take over vandalized, vacant, uh, abandoned homes in the neighborhood uh, and to green retrofit those homes, but really to do so in a way that is providing a, a grassroots community uh, development alternative, an alternative to the idea of displacement um, and, uh, and when, that comes with development oftentimes in neighborhoods like ours. I think that was more than two minutes. I love that. What brought you to it? Yeah, what brought me to it? So Ibu kind of, he kind of said it um, without saying it for me. Um, and, and I know, you know, for some of you who, who may have read Ibu's book, um, this is a, not a spoiler. But uh, for me, it, it was encountering Iman's work um, 21 years ago. We hold this festival every other year or so called Taking It to the Streets. Um, and at that time, you know, we hold this festival in Marquette Park, Chicago. Um, and it's, a, it's an arts festival. We bring together artists from across the country and, it's a, you know, and it infuses the social justice conversations around the issues that we're working on. And it brings people from all over the city of Chicago and now 20 years later, all over the, you know, the country together. And I came to this festival as a child um, and in elementary school. And it was the first time for me that I saw as an African-American Muslim girl at that time, um, who had been raised, um, you know, in a predominantly um, immigrant Muslim community um, that, you know, that I loved and that raised me and that, you know, and that, that, that nurtured me from, you know, that very early age. Um, I had come to see my religion played out, my faith played out in a way that, um, was both beautiful, but also um, in some ways emphasized uh, doing service, doing acts of service and, 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 and focusing our attention on the back, back homes of so many people that uh, you know, made, up, uh, made up my community. And so we would do food drives and coat drives and penny wars and a lot of that, you know, all of that stuff would go overseas. And this was the first encounter that I had ever had um, where I saw you know, Muslims from all over, from all different backgrounds, from all different colors, working on issues that really had an impact here on the ground in Chicago, on the South Side, you know, that impacted people that looked like me um, and the issues that, that people were facing in neighborhoods on the South Side of Chicago where I lived. And, uh, and I told myself that someday I'm gonna work for this organization. And yeah, 10 years later, <laughs> that happened. And I've been, I've been there for 10 years. So I, I don't want to say this in a way that casts aspersions on Alia, who has just described what sounds like the most wonderful job in the world, but I think I have the best job in the world. Uh, I, as a reporter and writer at The Atlantic, basically have the job of being a traveler. 
My job is to enter into spaces that range radically across geographic, religious, ethnic, political lines, and try to be a giant pair of ears to absorb as much as possible of the conversations that are happening in those spaces, and then bring that back to readers in as clear and a compelling way as possible. And over the years that I've been doing this now, a number of years, I've come to believe that the best stories about religion in the United States, the best way I can serve my readers being in this privileged position of being their traveler and their ambassador, is to focus on the questions and debates that happen within religious communities rather than about religious communities or between. Sometimes those are fruitful too and are often the, the topics of news and things that we have to cover as a journalistic outlet. But when I've been really drawn to a story, it's been uh, trying to understand the way that American Muslims talk about race among themselves. American Muslims are the most racially diverse religious group in the United States. And this has come up in a number of different ways in activist circles and beyond. So writing about that and trying to understand how Muslims think about that. Uh, talking to American Jews and trying to probe some of these really nascent and tender differences over the way that they relate to politics, relate to Israel, relate to advocacy and activism in this era. Thinking about American Catholics and how there's never been a really clean political fit for being a Catholic in the United States, neither Republican nor Democrat, some here, some there. People sort of make, make do as they are in trying to understand how those conversations happen in various and diverse Catholic communities across the country. The point is that um, I have had this privilege of trying to learn, being able to learn from people themselves about the things that they're working through and struggling over as communities. And my goal as a writer is to help people who don't have the privilege of being a fly on the wall in those worlds understand just a little bit more the complexity and nuance that makes different religious groups, which often get characterized as these big monoliths, makes them seem like humans who are trying to figure out what it means to be them in a particular place and time. So I've, I've loved that work and I, I do find it to be an immense privilege. I got here in part because I'm a traveler. Um, I grew up as a religious minority in a very, very Christian Southern city and then went to a Catholic college and then moved to a secular city and have kind of run the gamut of being in and around different types of religious communities. And I think for me, it's not so much about my own personal experience and drawing on that and writing about that, but coming to understand, having had that experience growing up, that there's always different interesting things to access in these worlds, commonalities and differences. And it really, I think, whetted my appetite for trying to explore and understand people along these lines of religion. Um, you know, I talk often about how religion is covered in the media. And in general, my view is that religion isn't taken seriously enough. And most importantly, it's not taken seriously enough as a cross-cutting factor across lots of aspects of life. So for me, I think that's been the greatest thing I've learned is that religion stories are stories about politics, about economics, about race, about identity. There's stories about pop culture, there's stories about food. There's so much religion that cuts across so much of our life here in the United States. And I get to kind of move in and out of all of those worlds as I please and uh, hopefully bring back stories that people will be interested in. I had turned my microphone off. Um, my story is not as nice and clean. <laughs> It's a little bit of a mess. Um, I wasn't born here. I was born in Mexico and in Mexico City. And um, I loved it there. And my parents decided that we do, would do well moving to the States. Um, and we lived in Miami for some time. I did my undergrad in Florida and was very happy there. And then went to D.C. to do my master's. And... It turns out that in the program that I had decided to go to needed, required that you work and study at the same time. And I needed to find a place to work. And I 
have always been obsessed with religion. Um, I minored in religion. I'm a, I am one of those Catholics that has no clue what politics is doing. <laughs> I definitely don't fit in to one party or another. Um, but I, I grew up with a very culturally intense manifestation of my faith. And I thought everybody else did too. And in walking into my master's program, I was kind of siloed from my religious views. Oh, you're so smart. I'm so sad you're religious. Um, yeah, I got that a lot. And um, especially as someone who's like a daily communicant, I, I go to mass every day. It's a part of my life. Um, I don't let it interfere with my work, but I think it fuels my work in a very interesting and wonderful way. Um, and so encountering that in my master's program, I shared with my parents how frustrated I was. And an opportunity came up to volunteer with this place I'd never heard of called the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. And, you know, life being what it is and Providence being what it is, um, two weeks later I was hired to run an international conference in Mexico. Beckett doesn't have international programs anymore, um, but it's, uh, it's what brought me there. So long story so that you understand why I've been at this one place for 11 years, which is super unusual for a millennial. We usually quit after two years, so... Um, and yes, super, I'm, I'm super millennial. You guys are all like Gen Z and super young with very good skin. Um, <laughs> the Beckett Fund is a unique place. It's a, it's a law firm. It's a nonprofit law firm that defends religious freedom for all. And when I say for all, I mean for all. We like to say A through Z, Anglicans to Zoroastrians. I didn't know what Zoroastrians were. Turns out the, the Magi and the Bible, yep, those guys are Zoroastrians. Um, and the first case that I worked on was a case defending goat sacrifice. And it was the first time in my very pluralistic understanding of religion and religious freedom that I encountered a belief that had been annoying to me. Growing up in Miami, I didn't like that people stood outside when they bought a new car and killed a pigeon and put the pigeon blood on the tires because it's part of a religious sacrifice that means something to them to protect their families when they get in the car. It's a very serious thing. Um, and I didn't want to see that. And I wasn't, why? Why? And then this case came up. And this man wanted to perform this religious sacrifice, wanted to have a dinner and pray over a goat it's a goat, sla they slaughter a goat, they have a beautiful ceremony, and it's how they pass on the priesthood from one, one person to another. It's a beautiful ceremony. And someone in the city of Miami thought it was annoying, just like me. And I realized the great hypocrisy that I was living in thinking that their religious practice was annoying. When I bet my mentions of Jesus Christ and my love for the Blessed Mother is annoying to some people. The iconography that I have in my office everywhere, you know, your religious beliefs are going to be annoying to someone, but it's not enough to tolerate their religious beliefs. You have to be curious about them. You have to want to know more about them. And you have to be willing to defend them because one day you're going to need them to, to defend you. That's the basis, kind of the understanding of the human person and everyone as searching for God in some way, whether you're mad at him and you're rejecting him for like 15 years of your life or maybe forever um, or you were truly engaged in this conversation with him, or you don't really want to recognize that he's there. It's not about who God is. It's about who we are and who we're meant to be on this planet. And that's what the Beckett Fund defends at the Supreme Court. And we have some cases that you've probably heard of, Little Sisters of the Poor, Hobby Lobby, Holt B. Hobbs, which is another one of my favorites. Um, and we usually win them 9-0. Because no matter what people tell you, Emma's the only one that reports on this properly, um, religious freedom is not a political issue. And you know this. You see it in the community building that you do. Religious freedom is about freedom. Everybody loves freedom. It's, it's not about right or wrong. It's about my right and her right and her right and what's true to us in, as individuals and as communities. And that comes up at the Supreme Court often. And oftentimes, in our cases, we win them 9-0. That means every single person, no matter who appointed them, no matter what party, no matter what kind of confirmation scandal, every single person on that court thinks that it's a valuable right and one that needs to be protected and defended. Awesome. Thank you. So, 
couple things that, that struck me. Um, uh, you know, I love this image. And Ali, you and I have known each other for 10 years, right? And I, I, I just have such high regard and deep love for Iman, right? Um, and I love this image of the 9, 10, 11 year old Ali Bilal, like strolling down the street in her neighborhood thinking, what's that music? I love that music. And is that Maghrib prayer that's taking place too? Right? And that's, that's the world that I want to build. And now you're like the number two person in the organization building that world. Like, I love that, that this happens to you when you're young and you have a dream of who you could be and then you become that, right? Jane Adams has this beautiful image. Uh, um, she writes in 20 Years at Hollis where she says, when I was a little girl and I wanted to save the world, I dreamed that I built a wagon wheel, Right? And what she does is she builds that. She just calls it Hull House. Right? So I love, I love that story and that image. And Emma, I love this notion that, that, that you talk about. I am showing that religious traditions cross cut across everything that we think is important in our society. And these things are made up by these imperfect beings called humans. Right? I just think that that's, like, that's an exploration that's so beautiful. And Mansa, you're your confession, if you will, that uh, I know what <laughs> um, the first religious community that you protected had a ritual in that in your first experience you instinctively disliked. And in the course of that protection, you not only deepen your appreciation for that ritual and the community of which it is a part, but you have a sense of, hey, other people are looking at me this way, right? And this is why principles really matter. And they apply equally to everyone, folks you like and folks you don't like. I love that. So, um, Matsu, you talked about this a little bit, but I wanna, wanna ask Emma and Ali had this question also, but I'm wondering if you have a similar story to Monse in the sense of, uh, um, do you have a story of uh, an interfaith partnership or uh, some kind of religious journalistic exploration that you were initially skeptical of or suspicious of, or you're like, I don't really like those folks. And it's actually kind of a peculiar story to you now because you think to yourself, well, I now see those folks every day. It's like standard operating procedure to work with those people. Right? Uh, does in in this is it a santeria practice that you were you were highlighting, Monse, in your first? It's a, a, a kind of a parallel to that uh, in in your work as a journalist or in your work in community development, Alia. You know, I'm I'm struggling a little bit to answer that question in part because I think as a matter of posture, it's not good for journalists to start with the idea. I don't like those guys. Now, I'm not saying that never happens, but in general, I think it's good for journalists, especially journalists who have my kind of role where we're supposed to be going in. I, you know, I work for a magazine of ideas, so we argue, we have ideas, we are a little bit more voicey in our writing, but ultimately, my goal is to go in and understand various communities and be fair to them and represent them in ways that maybe they won't like at the end, but at least that they'll recognize, that they'll, they'll read the story and also they'll say, I know that person who you were describing. I, I see that, I see myself in that. And I don't think a very good way of getting there is to start with, man, these guys kind of suck, but you know, I'll go and I'll, I'll talk to them anyways. Um, so yes, it, but <laughs> Muslim, Muslims are made up of people. <laughs> so are journalists made up of people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, I, what I'll flip the question a little bit. Um, I'm cheating and you can push back if you want to, but I will say that uh, religion and specifically writing about religion for a general audience, it's not given a lot of credit in the journalism world for what it is, which is a very technical beat. The world of religion, if we're talking about like all of them, which is a lot of religions and a lot of subcategories of religions, the technicalities just keep going and going and going. I think even for people who practice a faith, who grew up with a faith, they can even in adulthood be surprised by some of the teachings that are part of their own tradition, some of the things that they didn't grow up or, with or know. So for someone like me who does this 
general broad set of investigations into different types of religious worlds, there's a really steep learning curve with understanding all of these different aspects of religious life. And I would say that um, something that I've worked on a lot recently um, that's been really interesting, you know, I write a lot about Christianity because Christianity is the dominant religion in the United States. And uh, there are a lot of stories that involve Christians that I cover for uh, the same reasons that I cover everyone else. And I, I think I hadn't fully appreciated um, the difference in sort of mindset and mentality of Christians who are not primarily rooted in the American tradition. I did a story where I reported from Iraq about a small town in the Nineveh Plain, which is the region in northern Iraq that uh, was taken over by ISIS in 2014. And the recovery there for religious minorities, Yazidis, Christians in particular, has been really, really challenging. So I, I reported on that community and then reported on a family located in Detroit that was from that small town uh, that had made the decision right before ISIS came to leave. And learning about their traditions, it wasn't the first time that I had encountered people of an Eastern Christian tradition uh, or people outside of the United States, certainly. But it was a great and rich learning experience for me to understand how much Americanness goes into our assumptions of how we talk about religion here in the United States, which is what I predominantly cover. And how much also that kind of unites people in this funny way. Like a lot of religious people, even if their religious practices are really different, they're still very American in the way that they think about it and come to it. The assumptions that Monse was talking about, about our freedoms and rights surrounding religion. Um, so that's been something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, which is not so much actually or at all starting from a place of I don't like you, but it was a wonderful revelation for me, which shows there's a lot to keep learning and these layers just keep piling up. And um, I loved getting to be around them and try to understand more of their mindset. Thank you for that. That reminds me, uh, I, I remember doing a talk um, where I used the word Christian hegemony kind of blithely. And I recently, uh, a, a refugee from Iraq approaches me afterwards and says, I don't know what you mean, a Christian refugee. I don't know what you mean by Christian hegemony. And I looked at him and I was like, I didn't mean you. And then I thought to myself, what I had done was I had erased you. I had pretended like you didn't exist, right? Because when I speak of that term, frankly, I use it blithely and it only applies to some parts of the, of the planet. So th that's, a po think that's powerful for me. Yeah, and I think for me, um, you know, I, when, I, when I finally entered Iman as a staff person 10 years ago, um, you know, I took, I took some things for granted because there were some, some ways that we operated as an organization at that time that, um, that I assumed had just kind of been built into the fabric of the way that we worked. Um, one of those things was that, you know, we've always been a, an organization that has worked across faith lines, that has worked across ethnic lines, geographic lines, socioeconomic lines, et cetera. That's, that, that makes up the heart, of, so much of the heart of our work um, because we see the power in that um, in being able to kind of really work, uh, you know, um, the strengths, bring the strengths in from all of our different kind of backgrounds. Um, but what I didn't, you know, something, something that, that I recognized, two things that, that you know, that, that happened before my time that I realized have come to inform the way that we do our work at Iman. Um, you know, there is an opportunity that we had um, probably maybe, I want to say a couple of years before I started. So this had to have been in maybe 2006, um, Iman was working on um, a, another uh, parole reform, or actually it was a criminal justice reform um, campaign to try to pass something called the SMART Act, which was trying to, um, to, uh, to divert um, low-level uh, you know, uh, uh, drug offenses, you know, people that were guilty of low-level drug, drug offenses to drug schools instead of you know, locking them away into prison. And we were doing this work in alliance with, um, you know, with especially a, a bunch of black churches from the South Side and um, with others from across the, you know, the, the Chicagoland area. And, um, and something happened during that time. You know, we ended up, we passed the bill, it was great. It was, you know, kind of a momentous occasion. Um, and we were on the verge of kind of all going our own ways, all our different organizations that had, you know, had worked on this, this, this bill. Um, when, you know, there's this particular Pentecostal uh, preacher who's, uh, who is now a state senator. Her name is uh, Senator Patricia Van Pelt. 
um, at that time, Patricia Watkins, and she was the, uh, the, the pastor of a church on the south side of Chicago, a huge church on the south side. And, um, you know, she had the opportunity in her work, you know, they have a, another, they have a 501c3, a nonprofit that their church operates. Um, and it was receiving a lot of love at that time from the foundation world. And anyone in here who has some experience with the nonprofit world, you know, they're sometimes the darlings of the nonprofit world and they were the darling of the nonprofit world at that time. And so they were getting a lot of love from these big foundations across the, the city and the country. And, um, you know, we had this opportunity where, uh, where you know, she, uh, you know, sent now Senator uh, Van Pelt, um, she was asked to present in front of a really large national foundation um, that had given her organization hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, they asked to, you know, they asked us to present, you know, present your work to us and give us an update and tell us how you do it. And she, she invited our executive director to that meeting. And she sat in that room with the executive director and with all of the, you know, the board members of this foundation. And she told the board, this powerful board of this powerful foundation that had, you know, millions of dollars at their disposal to give that I cannot do the work that I do without this organization. And she was pointing at, you know, Rami, our executive director. I cannot do the work that I do without them. And I need you to fund their, their work in order for our work to flourish. And that is something that you do not see normally, first of all, especially just in the nonprofit you know, arena. It's difficult enough for nonprofits to, you know, to, uh, to, to get their own funding. And it's, you know, you're, you're not necessarily fighting tooth and nail, but you're, you sometimes see yourself as a competitor against others. But it's also, it was, it was new for us as a Muslim organization, as a Muslim-based organization, to have this Pentecostal preacher in the room telling this, you know, this powerful foundation that in order for my work to thrive, and this was a, you know, a faith-based organization based out of the church, that I need this Muslim organization and these Muslims that are working, you know, doing this work with me to do that. And, you know, we went on to go on and, you know, and, and, and form a, an alliance together called the United Congress of Community and Religious Organizations, and it grew and it, you know, it's made up of all types of, you know, black and brown organizations from across the city of Chicago. Um, and when I started at Iman, then in 2009, you know, I kind of just slipped into that. And I was, you know, I was one of the people that was on the table organizing with, our, you know, the rest of the organizers from the different organizations as a part of United Congress. And I just figured, well, that's just the way we do it. You know, that's, we, we're always, we've always organized with, you know, people across faith. And, and it's always been a, not just a, something that's lip, lip service, but it's been something that's really been in spirit. And, you know, I learned that story pretty early on because it just had such a profound impact on the way that we understood our work and the way that we understood our power together, that someone could stand up for us in that way. And we got the funding and, they, and we have, the, that foundation has been, you know, our, one of our longest standing foundation partners since that time. Uh, and I think that's just, that's taught me that, you know, all of these years that we have, you know, that we have, that at times other organizations might look at us and think, well, how can you afford to do that? How can you afford to, you know, kind of give away your, 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 your support base or to, to tell other people who to, you know, that they can, you know, to, to give your, your, your big donors to somebody else. And it's, and it's really thinking about the values that we bring to this work. How can we not do that? If we know that at the end of the day that each of our organizations were working for the same cause, at the end of the day that we want real change in our neighborhoods and our communities, then how can we not extend that? And I think that for us, and clearly for that organization, um, and for so many organizations that we've had the privilege to work with um, you know, since, that that's at the core of it and, and that our faiths are at the core of that. Um, and we've, we've, you know, that's become, as you say, a standard operating procedure at Iman. And I'm really proud of that. One of the things that I love about that story is, is uh, resonating deeply with the Muslim ethic of generosity, right? Part of, what, part of the story you're telling is that this other religious community extended generosity to you in a way that was, was countercultural 
and reminded you a community whose, whose doctrine you do not agree with reminds you of your own value of generosity. You think to yourself, this is how we should be rolling all the time, right? But it's you all like who stand up and with hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake, you're the one who extends your hand. I think it's a beautiful story. So we talk a lot about leadership at IFYC. We talk about, you know, leadership is diver di leadership around diversity is knowing that diversity is not just the differences you like, that when the mountain climber approaches the mountain, she's not surprised. She prepared to climb the mountain, right? Like, like, like uh, if you're going to deal with, with diversity, you're going to deal with conflict, like prepare for it, right? That we talk about that, that kind of stuff a lot. Um, so I'd love to hear if, from each of you, starting with you, Monse, uh, an experience that you had in leadership at Beckett um, that was really hard, but you look back and you think to yourself, that formed me and I'm better for it. I'm a better leader because I had to navigate through that. So it's a question for each of you. That's a hard one. Um, I think that I love conflict. Let's start there. <laughs> <laughs> conflict is fantastic uh, because it forces you to really know what you're talking about and really sharpen your knives for a good fight. Um, and at the same time teaches you prudence and temperance and compassion. So just there, I mean, you have my heart in talking about fighting because fighting is great. Um, and we, I think the hardest thing, and I continue to learn from it, so I won't say that it's behind me because I came into leadership at Beckett three years ago after already having been there seven years. Um, and Growing within the organization, um, I am the youngest leader the organization has had, and probably 10 years the senior of my senior staff. I mean, 10 years the junior of my senior staff. So there's a big gap there in experience, in age, um, in wisdom, obviously, but the greatest thing I learned was to listen even and within conflict to listen um, and to be brave. If you, are, if you are being intentional in conflict, it will be good. I had, I'll tell you, a, it's, it's funny, but it's not. Um, I don't believe in giving my baggage to my team members. So if I have an argument with Ibu, I, I'm not gonna throw it on Emma, right? Um, I will stop and reflect, pray, whatever it is. Um, I pray a lot. It's the only thing that gets me through my day. Um, and then I'll turn and I will deal with the next thing. And I had someone say, I had gone into an argument with a positive argument with someone. I got onto my next phone call and the person on the other line, one of my colleagues said to me, how come you always sound so happy on the phone? when I call you, it's like, is this a thing where you're like deflecting or you, you think you've got a problem with me that you've got to be so nice? And I said, no, I just had like the worst conversation that finally ended well and I was really happy, but I didn't want to put that on you. So I took a deep breath and I said a prayer and I'm giving you my cheerfulness. This is what you deserve from me. You deserve my best. And he said, I'm so sorry, I just called you fake, you know? Um, <laughs> But sometimes you, you have to go there and you have to go into that place of cheerfulness to be able to turn it around. And it's the same thing working. Interfaith partners can be frustrating. The most wonderful thing about working with people of other faiths is if they live their faith just as loud as you do. I always say, if you're not trying to convert me, you don't love me. If you know what's true and good and you don't talk to me about it, you don't love me. You're not my friend. And that breeds conflict. <laughs> so, I mean, those are some general experiences with conflict, and, and, you, and I will continue to learn from them for the rest of my life. I learn something new every time I get into an argument with someone, and if I don't, I haven't finished the argument. I'm not going to follow that up with anything. <laughs> Emma is. <laughs> um, well, you know, I was going to say some of my most trying experiences as a leader in the newsroom, but also as a reporter, whether it's somebody trying to convert me because they love me or 
with, you know, a rabbi who's not so happy with what I wrote, whatever it might be. Uh, those are stories, unfortunately, that I cannot tell to a ballroom full of 500 people, 500 of my closest friends who are all very trustworthy, but nonetheless. Um, so I'll, I'll zoom it out a little bit, which is uh, a really big learning experience for me as a reporter. And I think broadly for the media, certainly for the newsroom that I was in, which is the 2016 election. And this has been hashed and rehashed and re-rehashed. So I don't think there's a need to go through sort of systematic, systematic failures of the media in the lead up to that election. But I do think that the way that our assumptions, uh, largely coastal newsrooms concentrated in cities with people who don't necessarily share relationships with or backgrounds with a lot of people who might have voted for President Trump, uh, the assumptions that they carried with them into that coverage, it was really instructive for me to understand on the flip side what had gone wrong, the kinds of assumptions I had carried into my reporting, and also try to think about things that I could do better. I was on the campus of Liberty University, uh, which is in Virginia, the largest Christian university in the United States, uh, for the third presidential debate between uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump in October of 2016. So this is right before election D-Day. And I remember vividly, you know, going there and trying to understand, you know, what's going through these kids' minds. If you're on an uh, evangelical campus like this and an evangelical campus that's particularly associated with politics and the way that liberty is, you know, what is it like to be 19 there and entering towards this historic election? What kinds of things are you talking about and thinking about? which ultimately I, I found to be a really great reporting experience. And um, I don't regret what I ended up writing, but I do remember an encounter that I had with a kid who was probably 19 or 20, um, who had embraced wholeheartedly the sort of lamestream media attitude, love being called lamestream media. <laughs> and uh, he, so we were, you know, sitting and talking, asked if I could chat with him, et cetera, et cetera. And he you know, told me why he really loved President Trump and, how he was going to win and how he placed these big bets on it and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, all you reporters, you, you think Hillary Clinton's going to win, but you're going to be proven wrong. And I said, okay, okay. You know, what does this kid know? And uh, he found me in my Twitter, maybe six months later, don't know what he was Googling and uh, said something basically along. I don't remember what he said, but it was basically like, ha hey, hey, you know, something with that message. And um <laughs> This kid, I'm bringing him up not because I actually think he had any great insights into the 2016 election, nor do I think that, you know, uh, he was sort of like brought down as this sign to me of how my coverage should have gone and should go in the future, or that you should always listen to 19 year olds, which is definitely not the case. Uh, but rather that I just think it's important to go in as a reporter with an open mind, especially in these really complex totally different environments and try to understand people on their own terms and not have that sort of know-it-all script going in the back of your head. And, um, you know, as much as I might strive for that, which some might call that humility, <laughs> good word. Um, I think it's something to be reminded of over and over again. So insofar as uh, this could be labeled with a, a quality or a virtue, this experience that I'm recounting for you. I think just checking back in with my humility again and again and again, how much I don't know, how many assumptions I am bringing to interactions, how much I might be tempted to sort of, you know, roll my eyes at something somebody says. Uh, it's really, really important to try to keep that in check and be as good of a listener as possible and keep my eye on that bigger goal, which is telling stories in a fair way that can help readers understand with greater nuance and empathy, the diversity of religious and communal life in America. I, I, I agree that I think it's, it's, it's hard for me to think of a, um, of a particular story. I think for me, where the challenge comes in when it comes to um, faith in this country, um, and being someone of very outward faith, um, at least, you know, in, in people's perception. Um, you know, the, so much of, uh, of, of, I think, people's perception of faith is not just, um, it's not just the religion that they see on you or that they may, you know, uh, put a badge on you. It's also 
faith is so entangled with other issues um, like ethnicity, like race, like class. And it's hard for me to really kind of disentangle those things. And so I think the, the times in my life and particularly in the, in the last 10 years that I've been um, doing this work that have, I think have given me the most challenge and have given me then, you know, the, the most opportunity for, for growth, for, you know, for I think reflection have been those where there hasn't really been a stark line between someone's, you know, question or their assumption about my faith and what I perceive to be under the surface, uh, questions and assumptions about my class, my color, you know, ethnicity, background, et cetera. Um, and so there, you know, there are two, I guess, recent and, 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 and not as recent, you know, examples, I guess, that, I, that, that stick out for me then. Uh, you know, there's, there's a gentleman, I guess maybe six years back that, um, you know, that found his way to Iman um, a beautiful man, uh, you know, older white man in his 70s, something like that. Very deep, very introspective, very religious, very, um, uh, he is a uh, Catholic himself and, um, and, and just, you know, has become someone that is, has been, is a mentor and that has been a huge ally and advocate of Iman's work. But I remember the first time that he sat down with us um, and he sat down, this was also another funding thing. I, you know, I'm, I'm one of the development people at Iman, so all my stories are always about funding. Um, it's, it's my my na nightmares as well. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, the, the first conversation we had with him, we were talking about, you know, our work. It was like the food justice work that we were talking about with, the, with him and, and this program officer. And he, he kind of sat back and he, um, and he said, you know, I have a question. You know, I'm interested in the way that faith plays out in your organization, in your work. And that's, you know, that's a standard question. People ask us that all the time. We're happy to answer that. That's great. But he kind of went a step further and he said, you know, because I just, I sense that among Muslims and among the Islamic faith, that there's just a lot of rage. And, you know, people just seem to be so angry. And why do you think that is? Why are you guys so angry? <laughs> and my goodness, inside, of course, I, you know, this is still, I still, you know, I was still a little newish, especially to the de development world at that point. I did have some rage building up in me at that moment. Because <laughs> I just thought, my gosh, the, the assumption there, what, what, what's the assumption there? And, and is, it, is it really... Is it Muslims that you're talking about? Is it, you know, we had just finished describing the work that we were doing and, you know, our work is predominantly with black uh, uh, and brown people on the South side of Chicago. And South side of Chicago is, is predominantly African-Americans. We're talking about African-American low-income families like my family, like my, you know, my neighbors, et cetera. Um, and, and the question then that he asked was about that, was, was about this rage. And we're talking about how we're fighting social injustice, you know, and, and you know, and I just, there was so much that I wanted to say about, well, you know what? Yes, because Islam is a, is a faith of justice and it's about, you know, it's about making sure that, you know, that people, there are all these bad things happening in the world and we have to be people that are standing for justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't say anything, you know, like that. I didn't, I didn't you know, I, I tend to be the kind of timid one who tries to give the benefit of the, the doubt to the questioner. But, you know, it, that conversation kind of ended up, like I said, in a, in a kind of a, in a love fest, we ended up, you know, he fell in love with our, our work and with our, you know, uh, you know, our staff and, and we, him, et cetera. It was all great. And then a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to visit, um, to visit India, um, Delhi, India, with uh, this program at the University of Chicago called the Civic Leadership uh, Academy and had another opportunity where I kind of confronted this this question of, of, of rage. And it, there was a, a, another, there was a woman in our cohort that went, you know, on this trip with us. And, um, you know, we had one of the, the, the people that had visited our cohort before we left uh, Chicago was, um, was Charlene Carruthers, the, you know, one of the, the uh, founders of BYP 100, Black Youth Project 100. And, um, and she, of course, was there talking about her work in a very, you know, calm, mannered, and, you know, just, she was talking about her work. And we get to in India, 
and there was this, this gentleman that came to speak to us um, and he was talking about the caste system in India, which of course has been officially abolished, but unofficially still flourishes. And he's you know, coming from the lowest caste and he's talking about all the awful things that the people in his community have to do. They're, they're scavengers and they scavenge trying to, to clean the, um, the uh, essentially just the filth. They clean out toilets, um, except in slums, they're not toilets. They're, you know, they clean out filth, um, other people's human waste. And that man was, he, he was channeling all of the, the passion and the rage that he had you know, for the situation that he and his family and his community were in and the organizing that he did, you know, as his, you know, as a part of his daily life. And there was a woman that was, you know, bless her, that I uh, admire a lot and that I respect and that I look up to as a part of our cohort. You know, there was an opportunity where we were walking through the slums and there, you know, we're seeing all of these people that, you know, without limbs and, and without, you know, uh, children who were, playing in the streets as children do, but are clearly extremely poor and extremely needy. And, you know, and, and one of her reflections at the end of the day um, was that, you know, it was interesting, it was being there in the slums today because, because all the people just seem so happy. And in the States, everyone seems so angry. And, you know, except for that guy that came to speak to us, he was really angry. And I just, I don't know, like the people and, you know, the kids on the streets and the, and the, you know, and the, even the people that were begging, you know, for money that didn't have limbs, they all just seem so happy. And why can't, why, why can't people just be happy? And it just made me, it, it kind of, so much of that boiled over in me, I think, in ways that I probably, you know, now that I'm a couple of years past that, I feel like I wish that it hadn't, because I feel like that was a really great opportunity for some really good conversation. But I think um, so much of that, again, was just was coupled. It was, you know, we're talking about faith, you know, on the one hand, a few years back, and it's, it's encounter with race and class. And we're talking about um, faith again, um, and it's encounter with race and class, with, with, you know, at least with class. Um, and, and essentially, I think what it highlights to me is that you know, there's a notion that we talk a lot about at Iman called, you know, the proximity of pain and, you know, the proximity to pain. Um, and, and that, you know, it's very, very difficult for people to understand um, what another person in another, you know, community or another, you know, socioeconomic class, et cetera, is facing when they are not proximate to the pain that those people are facing. And I think that so much of the challenge, but also the opportunity of, you know, of, of, of our country um, is that we have an opportunity to be proximate to pain. We can get ourselves there. We can, we can make sure that the, the assumptions that we you know that we have, the perceptions that we have of the world don't remain assumptions and perceptions, that they, that they, that they become informed by real life experience, that, you know, we are both privileged we're privileged to live amongst so many different types of people in this country and in this city um, and in all the cities that y'all are all from. Um, there is an opportunity there to, um, to get out of your bubble, uh, whatever bubble that may be. And I have my own bubbles that I'm a part of um, and to pop those bubbles and to actually get ourselves closer to what people are actually experiencing. And I think that that is something that I have been working through and something that I have been, and you know, that has been informing the way that I approach the world, I, I think I've become a lot more patient in the last few years at least with these conversations because I think that they don't come out of malice. I think that they come out of true distance from people's pain. I feel like there's so many really powerful, what you are, the three of you are doing is you're giving us a window into the, the fascinating tensions in leadership at a really high level, right? And so are you being inauthentic when you exit uh, an argument and you give your best to the next phone call? Or are you saying, I'm a servant leader and, and I'm gonna give my best to you and it's not about me. It's not about my authenticity. It's about how I serve you. 
That's what it means to be the executive director of the Beckett Fund, right? You have every right to be angry at the 75-year-old white guy who walks into Iman and is like, you know, why are you so, why are you all so angry, right? And if you had been like, why don't you just like turn around and walk out racist? Maybe it doesn't become the beautiful conversation you say it becomes, right? So what, what's the leadership moment there? Is the leadership moment, I'm going to call you out, or is the leadership moment, I'm going to invite you to be your best self, right? Is that a, is that, you know, I think of these as Hudaybiyah moments, right, in Islam, right? Like, like, I am willing to step back a little bit because I'm playing for the long haul, right? And I want you with me for that, right? And I have this, you know, I will never forget an election night in 2016. I'm watching John King on CNN. And like, you can see the shock on his face, right? As he calls, like, it's like, I mean, Michigan just went for Trump, right? Like, you can like see him like being like, nobody I know with a graduate degree thinks this, right? Wait a second. But my friends at Harvard told me, right? And I love this story of like, you're like it. In Liberty University, you're like, what is this 19-year-old? You know, this is just an example of brainwashing. Oh, except he knows something about the country that those, fancy, those of us who are fancy and live in cities, I guess, didn't really know, right? And these, like, really interesting, like, leadership tension moments. And, and the thing that I love about what you're talking about is it's, it's not easy, right? It's not, like, super black and white all the time. And, and even at the level that the three, in fact, maybe because of the level the three of you play, it's really, really complicated, you know? So I'm going to ask one last question, which I actually don't want you to answer right now because I want to go straight to questions, but I'm going to ask it so that maybe uh, as we take a couple of questions, you find a way to weave it in, okay? Um, what does America need for interfaith leaders? from interfaith leaders in the year 2030 when these 19 year olds are 30 years old, right? Uh, and they could be the associate executive director of the Beckett Fund. People shouldn't come for the throne just yet, right? <laughs> or uh, uh, the deputy executive director of Iman, right? Or the, uh, um, the junior religion writer at the Atlantic, what does America need from interfaith leaders in a decade? Which is to say, what should these exceptional young people be preparing to be? So that's the question I want you to just kind of stone soup stew on for a few minutes as we get some questions in the room and maybe y'all could, you could weave that through some of the, the Q&A. We got runners. Uh, Brian, I think Akasha, uh, a couple of other folks. So we'll have time for maybe three or four questions. And then my hope is that uh, uh, um, Emma Monte and, and Alia can hang out for a few minutes afterwards and, and have some more personal conversations with folks. Tell us your name and the campus you're from, please. Right. Stand uh, up. Uh, my name is Weave. Um, I am an incoming student at Harvard Divinity School. Yeah. Um, and my question is, how do you deal with pushback from your natural allies? So um, thinking about um, people who might challenge you um, in the field um, that you feel are like necessary to conversations, how do you engage with their pushback in situations that maybe you are like personally invested in? Uh, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and I, I live that every day because we are a nonprofit that defends religious freedom for all, but we don't actually have an opinion on an individual religion, right? Um, and my brothers and sisters and half cousins at religiously affiliated organizations like to yell at me and tell me that I'm sitting on my hands in the culture war, that I'm not doing enough. Um, that I'm not really building the kingdom. And, um, and I think the best way to, rather than push back, but kind of 
elevate the conversation is to say, you know, we all have a, a, a place here. We all have a very specific role to play. And um, there's a great priest. His name is Father Sirico at the Acton Institute. He said something that I love. He said, piety is not as important as technique. And when you're doing the kind of work that we do, your technique better be spot on. And, and you better know where you fit and exactly what you're doing. And so when you're working within a religious community, like let's say Christians as a whole, um, and me as an individual Catholic, um, I have to know the, what my, my other Christian friends and the other denominations bring to the table, and I have to know how to explain their value and why they're important. And so I actually have a little war room in my office where I know everyone in my space, probably better than they do. Someone asks me about one of the groups that we work with, um, First Liberty. What's their budget? How many people work there? Who are their leaders? What's their organizational history? I'm there. I'm so there for that. I can tell you their best cases, what they've won, what I think they could do with $10 million if someone decided to give it to them that would be really good for America. Um, I can tell you those stories. And when people hear you talk about their work in a positive way and the fact that you took the time to invest in what they do, the conversation is very different. Nothing substitutes for preparation. Nothing. Great. You, either of you want to address that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm in a really privileged position and have been for the last 10 years in that, you know, that I'm able to do the work that I do with many of my co-religionists, if you will, right? So, you know, Iman is a, it's a, it's an organization that's based, in, that's rooted in Muslim values. We, we have, but we've got like 60, 70 staff, maybe half of those are Muslim, half are, are folks from other faiths. Um, but I'm able to do it in a way that, you know, I don't necessarily have people from my faith tradition that are, are kind of, at times we do, but those voices sometimes, you know, they, they get, they realize the, the greater good in what we do. So I think for me, what, what kind of turns that question on its head is, um, is the work that we have to do within our faith community to, 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 to actually agitate them to start thinking in ways that are more, um, you know, that are, that are more consistent with their values, with their professed values. And so, you know, for us, we're, you know, again, as, as Emma said, and, you know, others said, of course, obviously, you know, Islam and, and Muslims make up some of the most diverse people on earth and that, that follows both, you know, ethnic lines, but also, you know, just thought, you know, and, and, and denomination and, and understanding of the faith and, um, and even within understandings of the faith, people, you know, people are people. Um, and, but I think that the values at the end of the day remain the same. And when people do not act out of their values, um, but still kind of um, believe that the veneer of their faith will carry them, you know, that will carry them forward and will allow them to kind of drift into the world, you know, and, and, and exist as good Muslims or good whatever without actually having to do the work. That's where, you know, our community organizing spirit comes out. And, you know, we're, we're, we're intense community organizers and we believe in this term called agitation, which means that we, um, we work on the issues that, that sometimes get under our skin, that sometimes people want to kind of brush under the, the, you know, the, 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 the rug. So for instance, you know, one of the campaigns that we uh, run is, is a corner store campaign to try to get um, fresh, healthy foods into, into local corner stores. But you know, that's one of the end results. Um, but one of the other things that we're working on is actually trying to, 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 um, to bridge the kind of racial and um, you know, the, the, to heal some of the racial tensions that exist in this community. And so what that looks like in a neighborhood like the South, you know, neighborhoods like the South Side of Chicago is, you know, predominantly African-American communities that have, you know, the phenomenon of, of these corner stores, which are, you know, these small kind of convenient stores that exist sometimes multiple per block. Um, and, you know, where people go and, and oftentimes in neighborhoods where that is the only thing left that the neighbor neighborhoods have been so disinvested from and, you know, big box stores and grocery stores have left such, you know, so that those are the only things left um, in the neighborhood. Um, and they go there for their shopping, they go there for their, you know, for congregating, you know, with, with community members, et cetera. Um, but they're not always the healthiest places. And by health, I don't mean just, you know, that you can't necessarily buy fresh produce there. 
but they're oftentimes places of intense tension. And oftentimes that tension comes in from the fact that the people that are running those stores, 99% of those folks, at least in Chicago and in other metropolitan areas like Oakland and, and, and Cleveland and other places, they're run by Muslims um, that are typically coming from, you know, uh, 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 from, you know, backgrounds like uh, 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 Yemenis and uh, Palestinians and Jordanians, people that are coming from conditions that are not all that different than the conditions that they came into, but they've come with perceptions that media has given them about what black people are and what they deserve and what they, you know, what they don't deserve. And so they run their stores in many of these cases in ways that are not consistent with their values. And we have to do the hard work of agitating them and telling them that, hey, if you're gonna have, you know, uh, mashallah on, on your door in Arabic that says, you know, the, the, uh, God decreed it. If you're gonna put a Quran on your, you know, kitchen, on your, you know, the counter of your, 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 your um, you know, where your cashier is, um, if you're gonna profess to be a Muslim, but you're going to sell the community crap, pardon my French, you're going to treat people as though they're dirt. You're going to allow all of the perceptions that you've built up in your head around this community to really come out in the nastiest ways. That is not what Islam is. That is not what Muslim, being a Muslim is. And we're not gonna stand for that. So either you're gonna get right or we're gonna shut you down. And that's the kind of agitation that we have to do within our community and that we see you know, on a daily basis as something that, you know, that's a part of the mission. That's a part of the work that we have to do. So, I think it's, 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 you know, in my mind, when I think about a question like that, it's, 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 it kind of turns that on its head. It's what do we have to do? What kind of work do we have to do on our fellow, you know, co-religionists who, you know, who may come to you with, you know, with good in their hearts, but don't necessarily always act on it. So it is time for Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom to everyone, especially my Jewish friends. It's time for Magra prayer which means it's time to bring this to a close. So I'm actually going to ask, you knew this was going to happen, Emma, who did not respond to the question, to see if you have a 60-second answer to the question that I posed. Um, what does America need from interfaith leaders circa 2030? What should these exceptional college students be preparing for? Bring us out with that. Wow, this is a high, high pressure. All right, so I'm going to throw my Hail Mary pass into Shabbat in her faith. Um, so as Ibu asked that question, you know, in my mind, I, I'm not a normative speaker, right? So I don't call for what I want. I am supposed to analyze and offer facts and observations and that sort of thing. So I was scanning through my mind. I was thinking, well, what's different? about being religious in 2019 and in 2029 and 2039 that's different from today. And I think it, the answer is actually kind of simple, which is that religious literacy is going down. It has been going down. It continues to go down. And the fluency generally in America around religion is going down. And that's because of a number of reasons. In general, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, America is becoming less religiously affiliated, meaning less affiliated with institutions or denominations. In general, there are more people in the United States, especially people of your generation, who weren't raised with religion, who don't really know that many religious people. And also, the United States is becoming more religiously segregated. The United States is segregated in so many ways across so many lines, but there are these bubbles, these pockets, where everybody you know might be an evangelical Christian or everyone you know might be totally atheist and it would never cross their mind to enter a church. So I think for you, it, uh, my impression is that the price of admission for coming into this space is not that you have a particular creed or faith, but that you take it seriously, that this is something in people's lives and that they care about and that you want to learn about in terms of how it relates to other people and you want to deepen in terms of how it relates to you. And I would just say that my perception, my guess, is that that's only going to become more urgent over the next 10 years as we enter this environment in the United States where that vocabulary and that sense of call to action, that urgency, is missing. And so I, I think you all are maybe starting in the right place, which is increasing your fluency, 
increasing your capacity for empathy and encounter, trying to meet other people who are radically different from yourself, where they are and trying to understand who they are. And then hopefully being ambassadors, bringing that back to your campus communities, later on bringing it back to your workplace, to the town hall meetings that you're gonna go to because you're all gonna be super civically engaged. All of that I think is really important work and is gonna continue in its importance moving forward. You have blessed us with your presence and your leadership. We admire your influence. Thank you so much.